Last time, we looked at one way of locating things in the sky, the horizontal coordinate system. How might we organize what we see up in the sky in general? To help, I've taken some snapshots with an observatory simulation program called Stellarium. At first glance, we see a bunch of stars in the sky. You might recognize the belt of Orion, the head of Taurus, and the seven sisters, otherwise named the Pleiades. However, how would you point that out to someone who's never looked up at the night sky before? You might just wing it and say, see those bright stars in the slightly diagonal line near the horizon? That's the belt of Orion. Now the belt is surrounded by four stars that make up a rectangle. Those are the shoulders and feet of Orion. Orion also has a sword on his belt hanging down. That's a good start. What we've described is called a constellation. A constellation is just a pattern of stars in the sky. The stars don't have to be related to each other, and in the vast majority of cases, the stars that we use to denote a constellation are not at all related. If we look up to the right from the right shoulder of Orion, we see the V of Taurus the Bull. One of the horns of the bull has a bright red star. This is one of these cases where the prominent stars of a constellation are certainly related to each other. These are the brightest stars of a star cluster called the Hyades. Further up and to the right, we see the Pleiades, otherwise named the Seven Sisters. This is a real cluster of stars, and because the cluster's appearance looks like a tiny cup with a handle, we call its readily identifiable shape an asterism. The belt of Orion is an asterism. The V of Taurus is both part of a constellation and an asterism. Asterisms can span across many constellations, or they can be so small as to need a telescope to see them. Again, both constellations and asterisms are named patterns of stars in the sky that do not have to be related to each other. All constellations and asterisms are products of our place in space. If we went a thousand light years away from here, we'd not be able to pick out any of the familiar shapes, except possibly those that are directly behind us, and even those would be heavily distorted. I've just now added the artwork associated with these various constellations. This artwork is based on Western mythologies. A lost work of Hesiod's, known by the summary done by Aristosthenes, said that Orion was the son of the sea god Poseidon and Euryale, daughter of Minos, king of Crete. One day, Orion was hunting on the island of Crete with the goddess Artemis. During the hunt, for some reason, Orion threatened to kill every beast on earth. Gaia was horrified and sent a giant scorpion to kill Orion. The creature succeeded in its mission, and after his death, the goddesses asked Zeus to place Orion among the constellations. Zeus consented, and as a memorial to the hero's death, added the scorpion to the heavens as well as the constellation Scorpius. Orion as a constellation seems to be hunting Taurus the bull, and he's seemingly backed up by the unicorn Monoceros. He's followed by his dog in the lower left, highlighted by Sirius, the dog star. The dog, Canis Major, seems to be chasing the rabbit at his feet. There are all these kinds of little stories you can tell by imagining that these dogs and heroes and animals are up in the sky. Many other cultures also called Orion a great hunter or giant. Notably, the Babylonians called Orion the true shepherd of Anu in cuneiform tablets dating back to about 3000 BC. The ancient Egyptians from about the 23rd or 24th century BCE called Orion Sa, a god, whose form Pharaoh would take when he ascended to the heavens. The list goes on. But the current star names of Orion hail from medieval Muslim astronomy. That there are stories and myths and legends placed upon the patterns of stars in the sky says so much about humanity's need to connect to the everlasting and unchanging. It is easily argued that religious thought has its roots in noting the permanence of the star's patterns year after year compared with the frighteningly temporal nature of life on Earth. It's also a personal belief of mine that as we lose our dark skies to light pollution, we lose a significant part of what it means to be human. We lose our sense of things bigger than ourselves, and we lose our connection to the journey that is represented by watching the sunset. The slowly appearing stars in the darkening sky arise to tell their stories and remind us of ancient times and times that will be. As the sun rises, this alternate reality recedes into the realm of dreams. The striking difference between day and night calls for us to create these stories and learn from them. To help us understand the ancient stories better, I've traced the constellations with lines that denote the most prominent asterisms. This connect the dots game helps us better see the patterns. I've also added the constellations' names. Now I've added some names for some of the brightest stars. Aldebaran is the name of the Eye of the Bull. 
Beetlejuice is the upper left shoulder, as we see it, of Orion. On the right is Bellatrix, the advancing foot is named Rigel, the knee he's resting on is Saif, and the belt stars are named al Natak, al Nalam, and Mintaka. You can see Sirius in the lower left and Procyon and Canis Minor in the upper left. Most bright stars are named. Many have Arabic names, which have been formally adopted by the International Astronomical Union. This is partly in honor of the fact that Muslim astronomers kept the knowledge of ancient Greek astronomy alive in the European Dark Ages by translating Ptolemy's Syntaxis Mathematica into Arabic as the Almagest. Later translations, hundreds of years later back from the Arabic, allowed Western astronomers the opportunity to use improved measurements of the positions of stars and planets to eventually prove that the Earth orbited the Sun. Aldebaran's name came from the Arabic al Debaran, meaning the follower, because it seems to follow the Pleiades. The name Betelgeuse was derived from the Arabic Yad al Jauza, the hand of al Jauza, i.e., Orion. An error in the 13th century reading of the Arabic initial Ya as Ba eventually led to the European name. Sirius hails from ancient Greek, which translates into the Scorcher. We could go on, and I suggest you look up the star names on Wikipedia. Little tidbits are really interesting. Many traditional names have been used for centuries across cultures. It seems that the sky is a great meeting ground for people. I've removed the art so we can just show the lines and some star names. It's fun to draw them out for a friend when you're at an evening stargazing session. It might go a little like this. Do you see the belt stars of Orion? They're the three in a row close together, all the same brightness. Good. Now from the leftmost one of the belt, go straight up 12 o'clock to the bright red star. That's Betelgeuse. About the belt's width to the right at 4 o'clock from Betelgeuse is a bluish star. That's Bellatrix. Those two stars are the shoulders of Orion the hunter. If you look in between those stars and a bit up, you see a brightish star that's not as bright as Bellatrix, but is the third brightest right around there. That's Misa, the shining one in Arabic. And that's the head of Orion. So let's go now back to the belt. The belt has something right below it, the sword of Orion. The middle star in the sword is pretty fuzzy and doesn't quite look like a star. That's the distant star forming region called M42, or the Great Nebula in Orion. If we go just down to the right from the sword, we see a bright star, almost as bright as Betelgeuse, but it's blue. That star is Rigel, on the left foot of Orion. We're assuming he's facing towards us, so that'll be his left foot. His right foot is named Saif, which is interesting because Saif in Arabic means sword. Swords get moved around, I guess. It's chats like these that happen at every star party across the planet as people teach others the names and traditions of the sky. However, such stars don't help us with the myriad of other stars in the sky. So what's their story? In 1922, at the request of the IAU during its very first session, Henry Norris Russell produced a list of 88 constellations. But these constellations didn't have clear borders between them. Then, in the next IAU session in 1928, Belgian astronomer Eugene Delport drew up a definitive list of boundaries for the 88 constellations. He used vertical and horizontal lines of right ascension and declination to cover the entire celestial sphere. These modern constellations usually share the names of their Greek and Roman predecessors, such as Orion and Taurus. Those boundaries are what you see as the dim red lines in this image. Any star, planet, or nebula that is in that area of the sky is, by definition, in that constellation. So now it's not just the lines and asterisms, it's everything inside the red boundaries. Let's now take a look at one of those star charts from the International Astronomical Union. As you can see from the website on the left, this is where you can look at all the official ones. This particular star chart is published by Sky and Telescope and in, on behalf of the IAU. And what we see on the boundaries are, of course, across the bottom and top, you have the right ascension, which is the boundaries that are vertical, and we have the declination, which is the horizontal boundaries. The declination is given in tens of degrees, and the right ascension is given hours. So what we see is we see the boundary of Orion going around. It's bordered in white. It has the familiar asterisms in it, as well as numerous stars. What's a little different about this star chart that you might notice is across the bottom, the magnitudes are defined. A star's magnitude is how bright it is. So zero magnitude is like the second one from the left. The brightest star is minus two magnitude, which would be pretty bright. 
Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, so it lies just between minus 1 and minus 2 magnitude. The faintest stars are magnitude 6 that you can see with your naked eye in a very dark location. So this star chart reveals only those stars down to roughly magnitude 6 on the chart. We see there's also proper names on there. We see the green lines that demark the asterism. We also see Greek letters, which are the Bayer designations. And sometimes we have a number by it. So it's like Omicron 1 and Omicron 2, or Pi 1, Pi 2, Pi 3, Pi 4, Pi 5, and Pi 6. But we also have little squares, which are nebulae and so forth. And as you see in this zoomed-in view, there's the names of the stars. Betelgeuse has a secondary ring on it, which means that it's a variable star. And we also see some yellow little fuzzy patches. Those things are clusters of stars as well. Essentially, all the major things that you might want to do are typically located on such star charts. As well, professional astronomers use these star charts too, uh, just to make sure they know where they are in the sky. And now I'm just going to show you an example from a different pair of constellations, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. These are very familiar constellations in the sky, uh, notably the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. And the Big Dipper is highlighted by called Ursa Major, which is the Big Bear. And the Little Dipper is the Little Bear. And if we zoom out and look at them in the larger size scales in the sky, we can see how these constellations relate to the stars around them. So let's use Ursa Major to help us summarize this entire set of ideas we've been talking about. Ursa Major is the name of the constellation. The familiar asterism is the Big Dipper, and you can kind of see it highlighted with the bolder green lines. The rest of the traditional constellation is highlighted by the green lines, which are dimmer than the main asterism lines. But the IAU accepted boundaries for the entire constellation are the vertical and horizontal lines that ride along the... Uh, right ascension, and declination lines. Those are the official boundary for the constellation. The constellation is, of course, filled with stars, and it looks like we've got some new things in there. There are galaxies, M101, the pinwheel, and the interacting pair M81 and M82, as well as the planetary nebula M97. So these are some of the major objects in Ursa Major that can be seen down to, say, roughly magnitude 6 or 7 or so. M81, 82, and 101, and 97 are dimmer than magnitude 6, but we put them on there because they're relatively famous things to go try to find in a small telescope. Speaking of which, what are some free resources that you can use to have star charts so you can go outside and look for things in the sky? Well, a good place to start are the monthly maps that are provided by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory through their Night Sky Network. These maps are created by the Astronomical League, and you can go get them at this website that's shown here. What you get in this thing is a full sky map that shows all the way around, where you're look, assuming that you're kind of lying on your back, looking straight up at the zenith, and with your feet pointed towards the south. In this map, we can see where Orion is, we can see where the Big Dipper is, there's a bunch of other asterisms out there, and there's other things that you can go poke around and look for. In fact, this is a great way to begin, and it's probably your best start to go out with naked eye observing, just going outside and seeing what's up in the sky and taking a piece of paper with you. Don't take your phone, because your phone will give you night blindness, and you won't be able to see the stars if you look at the bright light coming out of your phone. All right, so there's a bit about constellations and asterisms. Keep looking up in the sky. <laughs>